Hey guys, welcome to the MIT Bootcamp e-seminar. We're just waiting for attendees to join. So we'll, we'll start in about one or two minutes. Hello everyone, for those guys of you who are joining right now, um, we're just waiting for another one or two minutes um, just to give everyone time to, to log on and get the, get the audio working and then we'll be starting soon. All right, I think we can get started right now. So again, one welcome everyone to uh, this e-seminar on for the MIT Bootcamp, the Sports Entrepreneurship Bootcamp. Um, we have two fantastic guests today from DFL Digital Sports, Bastian Zuber and Mark Cocker. Um, they are, um, Bastian is Director of Business Analytics and uh, Operations at DFL Digital Sports. And then Mark is the Director of Content at DFL Digital Sports. And both of them will introduce them in a bit more detail in, in a few seconds. Um, I, before we get started with the, with the actual e-seminar for today, I'll, I want to give you some background on um, the MIT Bootcamp that we're, that we're hosting in September. And uh, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Nico. I'm part of the team that is organizing the Sports Entrepreneurship Bootcamp, um, which will be held um, 7th to 13th of September in Hoffenheim, Germany. And I have a background in business. Um, I studied in Mannheim, then went to work in consulting for McKinsey & Company for, um, so I've been with McKinsey & Company now for almost four years. I worked across multiple industries, um, across multiple functions, and never got the chance to work in the sports industry, unfortunately, and then decided about two years ago to pursue a PhD in, in sports management to really get to know the industry, transition from um, let's call them regular industries into the sports industry, which for me still is a bit special um, for many reasons. Most importantly, all the emotions that are uh, a key point of the sports industry. Um, I'm doing my PhD at WHU, which is one of the partners for the boot camps um, and for the sports entrepreneurship boot camp in particular now. Uh, and we, so we want to, we really want to show people how interesting the sports industry is. It's bootcamp still has the same innovation curriculum than all the other boot camps. So it's about equipping people with the skills required to, to start a venture, to be a successful entrepreneur. But then with this bootcamp, at the same time, we want to focus on, on the sports part, show some, it's going to be tech heavy. So we want to be looking at technologies in sport. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, the the momentum and everything that's changing in, this, in the industry at the moment, we want to show why now is a good starting point or why now is a good time to, to uh, move into the sports industry. Um, we'll have great uh, lecturers from, from MIT and WHU who give, give state-of-the-art content um, what's happening um, in the industry. And we'll have great guest speakers as well. So if you're interested in this bootcamp, go to bootcamp.mit.edu slash sports. Um, applications are still, uh, still open at the moment. Um, yeah, check it out. And if there's any questions, let us know. We're happy to answer any questions for that at the end. And now, without any further ado, I'd like to hand it over to um, Sebastian and Mark. We'll talk about, uh, let's say, 30 to 40 minutes, and then have plenty of time at the end for Q&A. If you have any questions, please, um, at the bottom of your, um, of your screen, you'll see a Q&A folder. Please write, please type your questions into the Q&A folder. We'll, we'll manage them and then present them to Sebastian and Mark at the end and hope to have, a, a, say, 15 minutes of Q&A. Cool. With that, uh, Bastian and Mark, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you guys for being with us. Thank you. Thanks, Diego. 
Thank you, Nico, for the introduction. Hello to everyone out there, uh, in, out there in the world. Um, as Nico just said, we would like to give you an, an introduction on how the DFL and the Bundesliga is working um, in, um, in, on, a, on a general level, and we'll then go into detail uh, regarding how we execute, for example, digital marketing campaigns uh, here at the um, DFL. So again, um, hello to everyone, and we hope we can give you some, some, some great insights, and feel free to put as many questions as you can into the Q&A. Uh, we are happy to answer them all uh, as long as we can. <laughs> so great, let's start with who we are. Um, Nico just said to us uh, in the preparation uh, session that we had, it might be interesting for the guys out there to understand where you guys come from and how you moved into the sports uh, industry. Um, I will give some short insights on me and then I hand over to Mark um, because his way is slightly different than mine. Um, and when I remember when I started um, studying at University of Cologne, um, there were no sport, no, not really sports management courses out there in, in, in the university landscape. The University of Cologne just started to um, set up a um, new course which was called Sports Economics. Um, but I decided not to, not to be part of that. I decided to um, just study business administration um, from, from, from Key. And um, during my studies, I really focused on um, more on internships and getting experiences on how you work in real life than um, studying theoretical stuff. Sometimes I had the feeling I emphasized too much on um, the practical stuff and um, did not uh, learn too much for university. Um, but out of that also came my, uh, my first job at PricewaterhouseCoopers, where I already did um, two internships during my uh, time at university. And then um, also at Telcos, and then I started to, to, to work for them. Um, my, um, my projects were mostly with Telcos and media uh, companies. Um, I then switched from an audit consultant into the management consultancy because I found it was much more interesting to have a look in the future and not always look at the past. And I also um, then worked mostly at media and uh, entertainment companies. And then I became a dad and I decided hmm, I need another job because um, there was too much traveling and too much time not, not at home. And then um, by coincidence via Headhunter, I became part of digital sports. But um, more because I had a strong background in media and entertainment and less because I had a background in sports because I didn't have one. Um, but what we do here, and this is what you will uh, get to know uh, then after those 45 minutes, what we do here, yes, is heavily related to sports, but from the core, it's um, media stuff that we are doing from, um, from TV over digital stuff, uh, technology behind it, uh, visual design around it. We are more, uh, let's say, a little media company than a sports uh, company. And so um, I ended up here six and a half years ago when the company was founded. I joined um, the DFL Digital Sports and started as the head of finance and then developed into the director a role that I, that I have right now. So um, to sum it up, I always focus on uh, working more than studying, <laughs> um, focused on media and entertainment. And then it was a coincidence that the DFL um, decided to establish a media company here in Cologne and then there were some coincidences and I ended up here. Um, so, and over to Mark and then he can say some words about his way into the DFL. Thanks guys. Just to maybe uh, give a little uh, head start before uh, what you see listed here. So, as Bastian said, obviously Puff's very different. My initial focus was working in the iGaming. So iGaming is uh, poker, casino, sports betting, living in uh, a little location called Gibraltar. Um, at the time, I started working um, for poker, for, uh, for an organization called Casino on Net, which was the number one um, casino and poker website in the world in 2007, uh, 2006, sorry. Uh, obviously, this is the time where a where people in the US were able to bet and play poker, so it was a thriving business. Uh, after a couple of years working at 888.com, uh, decided to move into sports, purely to focus on my keen interest. I did enjoy working in poker, but actually sports 
very much as the passion and that's kind of drove me to move into B-Win. B-Win at the time were the number one sports betting or live sports betting uh, operator in Europe, uh, predominantly Austrian, German market. Um, so focusing on the coordination of media. And what I mean by that is at the time, we had bookmakers that were based around the world and it was our role to make sure that there was a broadcast feed or a stream for every single bookmaker looking to bet everything from uh, Argentinian tennis to uh, bowls to darts to soccer to whatever it was. We needed to make sure that there was a clear running order and allocation of anything up to about 800 bets per week. Uh, matches per week, then uh, decided to move back to the UK. Fortunately enough, uh, got an opportunity to work for an organization called Perform Group. You may know them as the organization that had recently lo launched the zone. Um, they at the time had a contract for Premier League, which is Premier League Productions at a time where uh, digital was called new media. So obviously things changed a little bit. It's media now. Uh, we were tasked with uh, producing all the digital content for all the rights holders, tel telcos, broadcasters around the world, uh, and then distributing those live or post-production uh, assets, going to new uh, new mobile phones that were able to, to stream video. Uh, then uh, made a move to uh, work in clubs. So had a period at Manchester United, a really exciting time at the tail end of when Sir Alex Ferguson was there. Uh, started working there, uh, started a David Moyes period, not so successful. Um, and then I had the opportunity to move to Tottenham Hotspur, which was and still is a really great challenger brand, a uh, really exciting period working for those guys, really developing their digital offering, um, working with a lot of the, the US sponsors, obviously I had Under Armour at the time and then coming in tonight. And then three and a half years ago, I decided to, to make the move to Germany obviously not German, as you can tell by my accent, uh, to take over um, the role of director of content. So obviously in strategy and execution across everything from digital content um, to uh, production of video content to uh, digital marketing, campaigns and activations, really the, the, the full spectrum of content that we do here on a B2C and a B2B level. Cool. Thanks, Mark. So let's move on and um, I will give you a quick introduction on um, the Bundesliga and the DFL itself so that you uh, understand who we are, um, where we are coming from. And then I hand over to Mark who will give you an insight um, on a campaign that we did and, uh, and uh, explain you um, how we deal with campaigns here. So hopefully most of you already know the Bundesliga. Um, I assume wherever you sit in the world um, that um, I know, uh, so we know that you do not have may not know too much about the Bundesliga as we do here in Germany. So the Bundesliga was founded in 1963, um, more than 50 years ago, and it is now already deeply rooted in the society of Germany. So there were so many nice um, occasions that that happened. Uh, the one I remember was the Champions League final between Dortmund and Bayern Munich 2013 in, um, in, in Wembley and of course the World Championship title in 2014 uh, in Brazil which was, um, which was achieved by guys who were raised here with us in the Bundesliga. So um, for us in Germany the Bundesliga is pretty much like the NFL um, in the US or the Premier League in England. Um, or um, any kind of cricket games that you play in India, um, it has the same relevance like those sports uh, in other countries. Some numbers from here in Germany, and there you see um, how much um, the regional identification and the part of the German society the Bundesliga is. There is a measured 99% brand awareness in Germany, which means, of course, 99 people out of 100 know what the Bundesliga is which is a pretty, pretty high volume, which I assume no other brand um, here in Germany and maybe not around the world might, might have in their specific country. Um, there are a lot of goals for games. Um, we have 97% um, of the German population of 40, 44 million people are interested in the Bundesliga itself. And there you see um, how strong um, the Bundesliga is here in Germany. Although we know that in the world numbers would look differently. Uh, because there are um, some territories in the world 
where of course the Bundesliga will not have those, um, those high values, but that's the reason for existence of the DFL Digital Sports, because one of our main objectives is to raise the awareness for the Bundesliga brand outside Germany in specific key markets. And that's, for example, uh, what Mark will show in a few minutes, how we use campaigns to support that. Here's a nice little video which um, shows more than words. Um, we believe, as we work with videos uh, and graphics, we believe that, um, that the, this will show you um, who we really are. And the video will give you a much better um, impression on that um, than listening to my words. We are the Bundesliga. We are just like you, but we are German too. Yes, our public transport is swiftly sleep, and we do wear socks and sandals at the beach. And yes, we are the land of Lederhosen, Leverkusen, Baden Baden, Kindergarten, Wolfgang Durch Technik, Arbiter, the Ruhr, and Brandenburg, the Tour. Is that really what we are? Sure. But that's not all, by far. We are the verve. 90 minute dream each week. The head and hands after the feet. The glory of the solo goal. The unfair loss of the broken soul. We are the heart. Our faith untamed by wind or rain. The years of pain without the game. We, we are the truth. Whether we win or lose each match, each time we still keep coming back. We are the faith. The penalty clear of the bar. Wishing for luck on distant stars. Hope though the clock says nothing left. The injured time, the sudden death. Sweat, tears, battle, stress, fierce tackles. We are flame, fight, stamina, fashion, lights, cameras. Yeah, so I hope this uh, short video gave you some insights on uh, who we really are. And I um, believe this video really transports um, what the Bundesliga and what Bundesliga football is. Um, there are so many char characteristics in it, like um, great stadiums, a uh, really great atmosphere in the stadium. Whenever you have a chance and you're interested in sports, um, in sports in general, uh, join us and visit one of the, the games that we have um, every of the, on 34. Um, weekends in the year, um, the atmosphere in stadiums is really fantastic and that's why we call it in here football as it's meant to be. That's the claim the Bundesliga uh, lives every day and what we try to live here every day by everything we do. That is our promise for, the, for today and the future. Um, we believe that the Bundesliga football is as close as um, to football can, as close as you can be to the original football which was is now played for, uh, for more than 100 years. Um, true football, true friends, true games, um, no investors in the league and um, still lovely stadiums uh, with a lot of fans in there and a very great atmosphere. And this is what everyone is dreaming of. We have um, as one of our core um, values uh, or core unique um, value propositions, we have full stadiums and a unique atmosphere. Um, there are more than 18 million spectators per season um, coming into the stadiums. We have the lowest ticket price in the European top leagues and the most standing areas, which everyone who has always been, uh, has ever been to a stadium knows that the more standing areas, the better the atmosphere is. Um, and um, of course, and we do have um, a nice average on more than 40,000 people in our stadiums per game, which is nice to know, but which you can only feel when you have ever visited one of the games. Um, I know and we understand that this is one of the most challenging um, obstacles we need, to, um, we need to jump over, is to transport this really great atmosphere to those guys who are not in the stadium, but who watch Bundesliga on TV. And 
And um, of course, you, you can never manage to do so with 100%, but compared to other leagues, um, you have a very nice, um, and very nice um, footage uh, that we deliver, be it via TV or through our digital channels. So, what is the DFL group? The DFL group stands behind the Bundesliga. Um, it's the organizational, operational business and the body, the governing body, the corporate um, behind the Bundesliga. Um, the 63, 60, 36 clubs from Bundesliga and Bundesliga 2 own the DFL. They are our shareholders and stakeholders. And um, they have instructed us to organize um, everything around the match, um, do licensing for clubs and players and all this stuff that you need to have a proper, um, to have a proper league running. Um, the system here is slightly different to, or is totally different to um, those that you know from the US, where you have franchises and um, clubs can move from one city to another city and have different names uh, year by year. Um, this is all different here in Germany to, to join Bundesliga 2 and Bundesliga. Um, you have to, you have to uh, make up your way from very low leagues and it takes years and a lot, a lot of money to become uh, one of the clubs in Bundesliga or Bundesliga 2. The corporate itself uh, consists out of uh, five main com companies, which is the DFL, our um, mother, and um, the, um, the corporate central in Frankfurt. Um, as I just said, they are dealing everything um, that has to do with competition and the rights and the game itself. Then you see the sportcast which is our um, sister company. We are sitting here in one office in Cologne, in Germany, um, and they are uh, responsible for the basic signal TV production out of the stadium, um, be it via fiber or, or via satellite. Um, so every picture that, that you see that comes from a Bundesliga stadium in Bundesliga and Bundesliga 2 is produced by our own host broadcaster, as, as it is called. Uh, and pretty much the Bundesliga is the one and only uh, football league big football league uh, that has its own home broadcaster. Then in the value chain um, or production chain, um, it's us, the DFL Digital Sports. We do a lot of content and digital um, productions for our own platforms, for our international broadcast partners, and we are responsible for a lot of other stuff. Then we do have the Sportex Solutions, a very important company, just founded um, one and a half year ago. Um, which is dealing with the um, relevant stuff around match data and um, technology that you need to grab as much data out of the stadium um, as you can as, as you can do um, to then build on that services um, for either the clubs or broadcasters or our own digital channels, um, be it widgets of players, how much goals did they, did, did they do, um, score, um, how many kilometers did they run per game, etc. So everything that has to do with match data that is happening on the pitch. And then we do have the Bundesliga International. They are the sales arm of the Bundesliga. So what they do is they global all the marketing, uh, they do global marketing and the partnerships. So when we sell our rights to Fox in the US, then the Bundesliga International has done the deal. If we do a Tag Heuer sponsorship deal around the world, then the Bundesliga International has done the deal. And so you see that um, from a sports league point of view value chain, um, the DFL and the Bundesliga itself contains everything in-house. So that is the strategy that the DFL um, is facilitating now for four years. Um, of course, we do partnerships with external vendors and suppliers and partners but the knowledge of everything needs to sit inside the DFL itself. And therefore, our strategy is and our um, perceptions that every product that we launch gets a better quality. You can argue pro and con on, on this, but this is what the DFL has decided and how we move on. So why do we think that we need that? Um, when you imagine, or if you're a little bit deeper in how the media and sports um, industry worked in the past. Um, we, did our, um, we did our stuff for whom? For, for broadcasters, they were our partners. What did they buy? They bought media rights. Um, how did that happen? We sold it to them. And then the fans, they just watched it, right? They were sitting in front of a TV and they just were watching Bundesliga games. Tomorrow, and maybe it's not uh, tomorrow, it is, um, it is now and tomorrow, um, we do sell, we do it a little bit differently or we need to do it differently because time is changing. 
And we are not do, we are not selling stuff and doing stuff for broadcasters, but for fans and media partners. Um, and it's not just broadcasters anymore because um, some of you might have heard that there are um, some deals that other leagues and federations did uh, with Facebook and Amazon and, um, and Google itself, um, where rights were not sold to classical broadcasters, but to media partners, telcos, um, one of those big new uh, companies from the US, which are also uh, interested in um, airing, media, airing the sports content. And what do we sell them? We, we do sell them sport content offerings, not just media rights. So what we do is a wide range of content that they get. They don't just only get uh, a live signal uh, for, the, for the live feed, but for us here, they get a lot of additional content. It's not just for us, other leagues do, do that as well. A lot of different, uh, different content, additional content um, that run with the games, um, be it for um, TV broadcast um, um, distribution or be it for their social media uh, and digital channels. And um, we don't only just sell stuff, so we need to create interesting content, not just sell it. And the fan is behaving differently. I mean, you know it and we all know it. Um, we are not just sitting um, in front of a TV screen anymore. We want to participate and engage. And this is how we need to make up our mind how we can produce great content with which the fans can participate and engage. We at the Digital Sports um, are divided into four departments. It's a product and technology team, um, which we have insourced a few years ago, um, which are responsible to build the back end and the front ends of all our digital channels. Um, we have my team, the business analytics operations team, uh, slightly of those, uh, more, mostly those guys um, who do the business intelligence and everything that a company needs to have that it can run properly. Um, we have the visual design team uh, who do all the design concepts concepts and visual elements for all Bundesliga productions, be it the logo, uh, the logo, um, be it the branding itself, be it um, the graphics in TV, um, everything that you see that has a visual element and is from the Bundesliga, our team, our visual design team he has produced. And then uh, the, the content team from Mark, he just uh, said uh, what the guys are doing. This is how we are set up. We are 73 people at the moment. Um, um, FTEs that we have, um, the Bundesliga itself has slightly more, um, and um, you see it's still, still a small team, but we are, we are doing great stuff here with, with, with all, all the people here on board. So I hope you got a nice first quick intro on um, what the Bundesliga is, what we believe, who we are, that we believe in football as it's meant to be, um, and um, how we are a little bit uh, governed, and how, how our governance is. And then I hand over to Mark, who will give you some more insights um, on the campaign that we did um, regarding the campaign marketing and digital marketing that, that we do for our broadcast partners, um, media partners, and our fans. Thanks, Christian. Yep, so moving forward, so obviously the, the main focus of today is, uh, is the campaign Be Whoever You Want. So this is, Bastian mentioned, uh, a campaign that we've rolled out um, to service the needs of our broadcasters, our own channels, to service clubs and service our players, as always. And the best way to start a presentation is with a nice video. Hopefully it sets the scene, gives you guys a little bit of an idea uh, of, of the execution of the hero video. And then we're gonna actually break it down into its main components, i.e. Uh, the focus of why we did it, the production, um, and then the performance. So let's kick off with a video. Thank <laughs> you. 
So hopefully that played all right for everybody uh, over the uh, WebEx. If not, I'm sure between Nico and Thomas, we'll be able to make all the files available later on. But maybe just to give you a little bit of an introduction into the uh, campaign. So the underlying rationale about why we execute this such a campaign is uh, to generate engagement. So we have uh, various forms of campaigns that we execute here, everything from commercial partner campaigns with our likes of Derby Star, EA Sports Tops, or uh, rights holder broadcaster campaigns. We do two, we execute two campaigns every year. We call them engagement campaigns. It kind of makes sense. Um, the rationale about executing a winter break and a summer break campaign is clearly, uh, there's a bit of a lull in action. So we uh, here at the Bundesliga operate a winter break policy, which means that um, from match day 17 to match day 18, we have uh, a winter break where the players can recharge and really get back. Um, it's a policy that Premier League, uh, I believe, is going to roll out in the coming seasons. Um, it's kind of perceived that it, it, um, it's the best for the players to generate the best energy in the second half of the season. Clearly, that's a slight problem because um, we, as Bastian mentioned have a number of broadcast partners and what we want to do is to give them a consistent level of engagement over the course of the year. So we've uh, isolated two periods, the winter break and then which is from the latter uh, part of December until mid-January and then the summer break, so from the end of the season in May until the start in, in August. And what we look to do is to ultimately generate uh, content and a campaign package that can be delivered to our rights holders. Um, we execute assets with a view that for them it's positive because they're generating engagement on their social channels. It also uh, generates noise uh, in terms of generating interest for the start of the second half of the season or in the purposes of the summer break for the start of the following season. We also uh, wanted to find a way to incorporate not only rights holders, but have an, um, a consistent execution that goes across international rights holders or domestic rights holders, Sky Deutschland, also all 18 clubs in the Bundesliga, which then filters down to players, and then finally to execute the content on the league platforms as well. Just in terms of an overview, as we talked about before, we try trying to produce a, a campaign that would be relevant for all 18 clubs, which we'll go into um, diversifying the content later. We um, talk about a period of uh, the 7th of January till the, 20, uh, 7th till the 21st of January. That is a period uh, post Christmas, which builds up again to match day 18, which is the first uh, match day in our Rook Runder, the second half of the season. Um, it was also uh, important, as we said, to, to have something that could be relevant, not just for an international market, but also a domestic market. Um, we devised a fairly consistent uh, theme throughout, which was uh, be whoever you want. So be whoever you want to be uh, was an idea that generated from our content team about um, the magic of seeing football through a, through a child's eyes. If we go into the conception, um, if we talk about uh, be whoever you want, the, the rationale about seeing, um, seeing the world and football stars through a, through a child's eyes is, is one, it's a, it's, it totally fits in with our uh, view about um, 
generating the next world stars. So actually in terms of what we talk about brand messaging, but it also allows us to have a consistent narrative that works. Doesn't matter what language you speak, if you speak English, German, uh, even if content's coming through um, uh, without any audio description or subtitles, it's a message that can be understood throughout. So that was, that was the, uh, the messaging that was wrapped around with uh, Be Whoever You Want. We also had um, a number of content assets. So you previously saw the hero video, uh, which we localized into different languages. So for a Spanish market, German market, English market, but also produced bespoke versions for 18 clubs, giving them not only the hero video, but bespoke uh, video clips, uh, static graphics and gifts that went um, that went to all of our recipients. There was also instructions via a playbook to include a call to action to make sure that we're not simply broadcasting content on digital platforms, we're actually engaging the audience and again generating that engagement which was um, initially thought of in the concept. What we talk about in modes of participation is we uh, have different scales, so we have full competition, which is where we give rights holders the opportunity to invite one uh, lucky recipient uh, to travel from wherever they are in the world to a uh, Bundesliga game. So that's a full level competition. There's a semi-level competition where we give the rights holders uh, merchandise inventory. So we could be talking about derby star balls, uh, signed shirts, um, everything to smaller little individual Bundesliga merchandise and then we have a non-competition mode where we simply give the assets to the rights holders where they can post them on the platform. Now clearly there's a big difference between full competition and uh, non-competition but due to legal uh, implications in different markets, different markets having different uh, laws about prize and gamification, uh, we offer a full array to make sure that we don't isolate any of the rights holders. And then as we said, talked about before, is a communication. The communication is directly um, produced for digital platforms. So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, as such we produce all of our video assets in a ratio of 69 and uh, one one. It's fair to assume that next year we'll also be producing assets in nine by 16, but we'll see how um, things develop in that regard. We uh, talk about the, the campaign ecosystem as we, as we talked about before, we have our core triangle. So we have our um, div domestic and international media partners. So those, uh, those in the market such as uh, Fox Sports, Fox Sports Latam, Eleven Sports, um, all of the participating right, uh, rights holders. We also have the 18 clubs and we also have the, the Bundesliga platforms which is our primary campaign core, but then also working in the, in the secondary extended campaign activation uh, area is our commercial partner. So as you may have seen in the video, we incorporated Derby Star, uh, which is our official ball supplier. And then also DFL Stifton, which is uh, our foundation, which also have uh, communication platforms which distribute content. Just in terms of production, um, we, to produce the hero video and all of the supplementary content that you saw in the video, we, uh, we had different stations or different locations where we, where we captured the content. So primary was our media days. So as an organization at the DFL DS, we also traveled to all 18 clubs where we uh, capture all of the content requirements. In this instance, as you see here for the, uh, for the engagement campaign, this was the filming that took place at Bayern Munich, but we also do all of the other requirements um, for all of our rights holders, all the editorial campaigns, etc., etc. Secondly, second location, which has got that kind of uh, historic rustic brickwork, is uh, um, a location in Köln, in Mulheim, and actually, uh, interestingly enough, this area now doesn't exist. It's been completely knocked down. So I think we did all of the, the filming about one month, two months before all of this area was knocked down to, to make way for new buildings. So really great that we managed to, to do one last shot shoot before, before all of this was knocked down. 
and then lastly was the uh, was the location shooting at the Stadion. So at uh, at Dortmund's amazing stadium, uh, we captured all of the content. Uh, as you can see in the video, really great shots. Uh, it would be worth noting also, interestingly, uh, that the activities by the child were also picked up, as you see here in the video, by Bild, which is uh, the ger biggest German tabloid. Um, so it's just to, to indicate that um, the activities that, that we think of in an insular campaign actually is also seen on the world stage and can impact. And we also here uh, see that the young child was invited to the next game um, at Leipzig Stadium where they interviewed him and talked to him about his activities in the country. Just giving you a bit of a view on the content mix. So as we said, all, all video assets in 69-1-1 ratio, all assets distributed in English, uh, Spanish and German. And then uh, we also, for all of our uh, other markets, produce content uh, which is clean. So uh, any Chinese rights holders, any Thai rights holders, wherever they are in the world, if, if English, Spanish, German doesn't cover their language set, can also um, adapt and change them to their market specifics. We talk about videos, GIFs, uh, statement videos, which are pieces of camera, and also graphical executions. As you can see here, we, uh, we did club-specific videos, um, statics, localized videos for different markets, our core focus in this instance was LATAM, Africa, Asia, North America. So we adapted the videos, as we'll see here. We have, a, we have an adaptation. So what we looked in the first video was, uh, what we saw in the first video was the hero, which is the global execution. So we cherry picked key players that we thought would uh, resonate on a global level. Uh, that means to say that uh, we feel this would be the best broad rush approach in terms of players. But then you'll also see that we adapted it for a Latin market where we brought in the likes of Hamez as a primary player, um, other players including William, etc., etc., to make sure that this really resonated not only with Latin players but also key players like Marco was. And then finally, uh, you can see that we also did a, a bio-labor tools and bespoke version with, um, with the likes of Leon Bailey, um, uh, Wendell, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure um, that we gave assets that could be given directly to the club. So if I just go, let me just one back. You'll see if we talk specifically about the execution to the clubs. So we gave all of the assets uh, to the clubs on with a view that they could distribute it through their own specific network, their own specific network being primarily the players. Obviously, each of the 18 clubs has their own sponsors. They have employees, they have uh, club legends, and the view was to give them this suite of, of, of content assets uh, on the basis that they could take this concept of who do you want to be and then and ultimately adapt it to their own, uh, to their own in this instance, uh, Hoffenheim view, but also each club comes at it from a different angle. So it's, it's again just continuing to use different networks to make sure you radiate and communicate the messaging as far as possible. Just to give you a bit of a flavor, we also had uh, gifts. So uh, we have um, the most su successful domestic uh, football leagues, uh, Giphy channels. We've had over a billion. Uh, players on Giphy. So due to the success of this, we decided to incorporate it for rights holders. So we had four different versions. One was a, a match day specific. So we said, uh, if you remember, we built up to match day 18, which is the first match day after the winter break. So we had a club specific, uh, match day specific one. So we can see here the clubs Wolfsburg were playing Schalke. So we did all nine fixtures, again, to just generate some uh, engagements and conversation with a view that every time we post uh, GIFs or content, we should have a call to action, maybe a Twitter poll, uh, an Instagram stories question. So again, just, just finding ways to generate interest and engagement. We also had um, campaign specific funnies that you can see in the campaign uh, in the bottom corner and also the club specific. So we've given 
all of the 18 clubs gifts, which they in turn have been able to put onto their Giphy or their tenor platform. Again, just generated more value for each of the stakeholders. Just a bit of a mood board for the, for the key visuals. Again, everything was distributed from a PSD level, allowing rights holders, clubs, uh, and third parties to adapt them, to really incorporate their messaging, be it their bespoke messaging or their own language. And here's just some examples from uh, rights holders. So rights holders posting across the globe with their different executions, some incorporating uh, prize and gamification, some simply with calls to action. We have uh, club executions as well, so from uh, different language sets, all incorporating the same uh, video assets. You'll see here a really good example from uh, Ausberg, who again, like we talked about before, took, the, uh, took the, the core message and adapted it and produced their own video content to support it. So uh, players asking, uh, who do you want to be in regards to, uh, to a game to produce content, which was then posted on their, on their platforms. And then, uh, then lastly, but not leastly, the Bundesliga platform. So we see here the full array of different language sets. So we have everything from our Weibo channel in China, to um, English language uh, posts, to Instagram stories, and, and everything in between to make sure that, again, we're getting that messaging out as, 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 um, as clear as possible in each of the markets. The Bundesliga will return uh, for match day 18. Hopefully that was clear. Hopefully Nico and uh, Thomas have got some questions for Sebastian, more Bastian, <laughs> uh, and myself, and uh, happy to go through them at any time. Cool. Thank you guys, uh, very insightful, very interesting. We do have a couple of questions that came in and I suggest we start with questions that, that go to the campaign first and then go into more general questions. So um, one very interesting question that just got in is, uh, in the Be Whoever You Want campaign, you're focusing on, you're putting the players into the center um, and now you're not necessarily focusing on the strengths of the league that Bastian was describing in the beginning, you know, full stadiums, et cetera. Um, what's your plan for the future? Will the players always be key or central or would you also focus just on the league itself? Yeah. That's a really good question. So um, we, as we said before, we produce a winter engagement campaign and a summer engagement campaign, but we also, all in all, we execute uh, 41 campaigns over the course of the season. The, winter, the engagement campaigns are the biggest, it's fair to say, but, um, but as I said, 41 over the course of the season. Now, every campaign that we produce uh, has a brief, it starts off with a briefing note, which comes from the stakeholder group that wants to execute the campaign. That then goes to our communications team, which are uh, the, uh, the bastions of the, of the brand. And, what we need to do is to work out what the key messaging, the brand messages that are very clear from, from the brand uh, overview, what messages are going to be incorporated in the campaign. So in, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, this winter engagement campaign, the focus was the players, 100%. Um, but that's not to say that for the up and coming winter and summer campaigns, that that will be the focus. It's very much, uh, based on the nucleus comes from the requirement, what do we want to achieve? And then what are the underlying brand DNA strands that support that? Very cool, thank you. Um, another question that goes in a similar direction is, if you, if you ever outsource content creation uh, or tech development, maybe, maybe we should separate it, but for a content creation, is it all uh, produced by yourself or do you outsource part of it? That's a good question. So we have, um, we have a broadcast and digital video team that sit in, in the content department who are checking through all uh, executions that are done from any external vendor. So uh, to be clear, we are uh, a team of 30 in the content department. We, um, we oversee uh, content across um, currently 11 different languages. Now, as you can imagine, we're not able to nor have the, the, the competency to produce content in all those different languages because of the nuances of or each of these markets. So we have, a, we have a core team that work internally. Then we have a, a pool of freelancers that work with us uh, with regularly on, on a, a 
across the different uh, content elements that we work on. And then we have a core pool of, of vendors that work for us around the world. Everything that we produce, doesn't matter if it's going out on a Thai Facebook post, on an engagement campaign, on a, on a website, everything that we produce and distribute is official Bundesliga, which means that everything that we produce has to be checked to make sure that it's the right messaging, that it's on brand, that the tonality is correct. So um, we are heavily reliant on our internal team to make sure that all of the assets are true to the core uh, Bundesliga brand uh, across visual identity to, to the brand messaging. Um, and another question relating to this, uh, it makes sense that reduces risks as well. How do you think about user-generated content? Or are you thinking about providing a platform for the user so they can create content, which obviously you cannot check anymore internally because the resources would be too intense? Yeah, so 100% um, UGC uh, is a really big topic uh, of how we can uh, give a vehicle to our fans, our uh, fans across the world to that are producing content around Bundesliga, how can we give them a platform to really uh, to, to be seen across the world? Uh, there's actually, maybe Bastian knows more than me, there's some legal uh, restrictions in Germany that we have about taking UGC content, which makes it a little bit more challenging. I think it's definitely something that we'd want to do in terms of a content marketing level. I don't think it has a place necessarily um, in something like the winter engagement campaign unless we in the future, build a campaign about which was focused solely on UGC. So that could be anything from creatives to send us footage of you replicating a goal. There's definitely a, a, a need and, a, and uh, a desire from our side. It's just about getting over the, the legal ramifications and making sure that it's a framework that we can take the, the, the assets, the UGC assets, and and again, screen them to make sure that they fit in line with our brand. Because as you said before, anything that goes on a, on a Bundesliga platform is a message from us. All right, cool. Um, maybe uh, switching a bit to the, the DFL in general, there was one interesting question. What about women football? I mean, this was a campaign specifically for the, for the men's Bundesliga, but there's also the Frauen Bundesliga, women's Bundesliga. Um, could you, could you share a few words about women football against men football? Mm, the um, women's football is still um, bodied and um, governed by the DFB itself, the Deutsche Fußballbund. Um, the DFL is only responsible for Bundesliga, Bundesliga and Bundesliga 2, even not for Bundesliga 3, which exists in Germany. Um, but this is um, also handled by the DFB itself. So we were just so the DFL. Um, Deutsche Fußballliga was just um, established to um, market and organize everything around Bundesliga and Bundesliga 2, men's football. Everything else sits with the DFB. Great, thanks. Um, that's also interesting to understand the setup here. Um, a lot of questions were around the topic of qualification. So if you're, um, maybe, maybe a few questions together. What are the skills required? to be active in the sports industry and working on digital topics. And the second part would be for adults, because I guess you, you get a lot of young talent, but for adults who still want to work in this industry, how can they train and prepare to not, to not uh, fall behind? Sure. I mean, Bastian uh, was talking earlier in a, in a previous conversation about, we are obviously here to generate content around the Bundesliga. But actually, in some instances, we proactively have looked for people from different backgrounds and not necessarily sports background. I'll give you a perfect example. Is, uh, in, uh, in April of last year, we installed a central planning and campaigns unit within content. So we've always had a, always had a, a broadcast and a digital video team. We've also had a, a digital content team, so more uh, let's just say more focused on uh, editorial uh, content management across web, social, uh, written editorial, etc., etc. 
but we needed, and we, we recognized that we needed to bring in people from different disciplines uh, to oversee campaign uh, and central planning. So we've actually brought people in from agency background who have no sports background, because actually what we needed was a different skill set. So I think as, uh, if we look back, and I can definitely say from, from experience that sports organizations are changing. So they're changing from sports organizations to entertainment companies, because actually the, the sport itself is, I wouldn't say not enough, but it's, uh, it, we, we as sports organizations need to find ways to resonate with different people from different markets and different age groups from different interests. And, and actually the successes that we have in the content sphere in certain markets might not necessarily be about football uh, directly because people don't have an affinity with either football as a whole or Bundesliga or whatever. So actually what they want to do is to engage with, with short form animation or with funnies or whatever the topic. And actually that gives an opportunity for people from different walks of life to uh, add value to what would be a sports media organization. Yeah. And maybe to add on that, I think the, um, the most important um, fact is that um, clubs and um, sports organizations, especially um, those who are not um, set up like the franchise ones in, in the US, are getting more and more professionalized. So a few years ago, there were just clubs um, or organizations. Now there are real companies, right? With all the functions that real companies have, like um, everything that you have at business uh, that you have in, on an administration perspective, like contract management guys who deal with compact legal departments, finance departments, HR departments, and they are getting more and more um, professional compared to the years before. And therefore, um, even now the sports industry, as it is changing, needs basically every function that every other industry has um, itself to. Uh, and therefore, um, And Mark just said it, we sometimes, or sometimes we say, um, it's good to have guys from outside who are not um, for too long in the sports industry and, uh, and work for another sports company because um, it's always good to get fresh insight from, from, from outside. And when we, for example, um, hire developers, um, then we don't care if they have worked for a sports organization or a club before. Uh, we just hire them because they are really great in coding. And if they have um, coded um, a website for a retailer, then fine. If it's a great website and he has great, um, he has great skills on how to code, then fine. Um, and therefore, I think in these days, moving from an industry into the sports industry is much easier than it was um, in the years before because now everything is getting more and more professional. It's bigger, there's more money in the fluid and therefore... Um, there are more more opportunities, and if you want to, just try. Uh, never, 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 never. Don't be too courageous not to try. Just try it and be curious, and then you will end up in the sports industry. Very cool. Um, another question that came in is: if there is an official second screen app operated by the Bundesliga, um, and if if yes, how do you use it to create fan engagement? There isn't uh, an official uh, second screen. It's not something uh, that we've employed in the past. It's potentially could be something that we could do in the future, uh, but ultimately the likelihood would be that it would be a, a white label for rights holders in the market. But currently there's, there's nothing in place uh, for a second screen experience. Clearly we have our uh, official uh, Bundesliga app, which is uh, the primary source for coverage on a match day, for news, for video content, um, which ultimately can be used as a second screen experience, but it's not a, a bespoke one for rights holders currently. Right. Um, we go through the questions. Another question, it says the, the slogan you were using is football as it's meant to be, it's English, even though we were talking about Bundesliga being such a German product. Um, how do you translate it or how do you communicate it to German fans? Um, basically, we don't, we don't translate it. Uh, football as it's meant to be is football as it's meant to be. And um, there were discussions um, if a German league should have a German, a German or an English claim or if we should translate it. Um, but from a brand perspective, since we are 
yes, the Bundesliga, and yes, we are originated and localized here in Germany, but we are an international brand, an international league, and therefore everyone is happy um, to use football as it's meant to be as our, um, as our worldwide claim, although we don't stress it in Germany too much. All right. Then the, the, the distribution of your content, is it all done manually or do you have any automated systems to, so you said you check all content, but is there any ways to distribute automatically? Um, and how do you, and then there's it's two questions basically. The, set, the second one would be, how do you use data and then analytics that you collect from your campaigns? So, um, so I guess first question, We've developed uh, an in-house uh, B2B distribution tool where all rights holders, third parties can access all content assets. So that's indexable, you can do previews, so it really makes the experience from a rights holder perspective re really a seamless one. In terms of upload, it's very much a, a manual process where we have to produce, as you saw in the presentation, a large number of assets. Each of these need to be uploaded to the tool. But in terms of the front end experience, it's actually quite straightforward because you can index it by language preference, by rights, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very much a manual process um, once the content has been screened. And the, um, in relation to the second question, just you repeat the second question? Uh, I, can, I can answer that. So uh, regarding uh, analytics, um, almost four years ago, we um, said here in the company that we want to become not a data-driven, but a data-informed company, um, because we know it makes totally sense to rely on data. Um, and therefore, we set up our own business analytics practice with um, a small team, uh, with a nice um, business intelligence system uh, behind it, uh, which has a really nice um, technical setup all hosted on AWS with a really nice software uh, behind it and a nice visualization software called ClickSense, um, has up for ClickSense. And uh, um, this is a really, 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 a really nice self-service tool where everyone here in the company gets training on and um, is asked to use it um, and to dig deep into numbers and pretty much everything um, that we do content-wise um, is analyzed on how it performed. Um, we do have our established our own metrics like an article performance score and a video performance score, which is based on statistical methods uh, on which we um, discuss if an article was great or a video was great. Um, and therefore, um, we are a well data informed company using um, data as much as we can and where it makes sense, um, investing um, some resources into having uh, a nice technical setup behind it so that people just have the possibility um, to use data um, during, during their work. And we also know what La Liga and um, all the other leagues, um, how they are performing with all the data that we get. And we can just push the button and then we have mostly all analysis, analytics that we need for our digital daily, uh, daily, for our digital daily work. And this is, um, I have the feeling that it's um, and talking to other companies our BI system for digital analytics is much more sophisticated than other companies have a BI system for their financials. Cool, thanks. Um, question that was following on, on what you just described. Is it fair to say that growth for DFL will mostly come from international markets or are you looking to grow within Germany too? So from a, especially from, from our perspective, we're, heavily focused on uh, from international development so we work a lot with our uh, sister organizations to support international growth so we're looking at markets with um, some cases little to no propensity to, for bundesliga in a historical sense but actually that's the areas where we have the greatest opportunity to, to develop a brand so as bastian talked about in, the, in an earlier instances that we've got really great brand um, exposure and not a acknowledgement from, from a domestic market sense and actually for our perspective in a, in a content marketing level, be that digital content or digital activations or, or however we're communicating the messaging of uh, Bundesliga that we're really heavily skewed to an international uh, perspective, hence having such a, an international mix of people in the organization 
um, which really allows us to be authentic because we can obviously approach China, uh, Thailand, uh, Colombia, but actually unless we've got the people with the internal knowledge to understand how can we uh, portray the message at the right level, at the right time, with the right forms of content, it's quite difficult. And that's why we have this nice model of internal competence, freelance competence, and then uh, selected vendor competence. All right, that's good. Thanks. Uh, we got two more questions. The first of that is, you described earlier a little bit the beginning of a campaign, but how exactly does the ideation process look like? How do you decide the content of a campaign? Yeah, so what, what we talked about earlier to the earlier question about <clears throat> the start of the campaign is the, it comes from the stakeholder group within the organization. So in this instance, our audio visual rights partners or sister uh, department um, came up with the need that we needed to support our broadcasters. So what we talked about at the beginning of the slide was during those two periods. So that's clearly the motivation. The secondary motivation was to, to bring together a consistent message from rights holders to commercial partners, to clubs, to own platforms. So there's, there's the drive and the impetus. And then uh, we then fold that with what the brand messaging is. And once we have a clear understanding of what the requirements are and the brand messaging, we can incorporate that with our central planning and campaign team who will uh, come up with an ideation phase about different potential uh, ideas that we could execute that goes into a into a larger group discussion. So everything from our uh, audio visual right partners to Bundesliga International to our uh, visual design team to our communications team to make sure that all of the key stakeholders um, are aligned on what we want to achieve and how we want to achieve it. And then once we have a sign off on the ideation phase then we really go into the the fun stuff of working with vendors to really how can we tell the story how can there be a narrative how can we generate a number of assets that are engaging but also adaptable across the different sets that we talk about be it global localized clubs etc etc very cool um final question for both of you guys actually who do you think in the world of digital sports, who is leading, who is best practice, where do you turn to if you, if you look for inspiration or if you want to learn something? Okay, maybe I'll go first. Sure. I'll, I'll give you some time. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, it really is different across the full array. So um, what we don't do here at the Bundesliga is just sit and compare us how Premier League and La Liga do. We, our whole content uh, mix is coming from a, very non-traditional way, we, we kind of call it Pundesliga. So we play a lot on different channels for different markets with different forms of content. So we are working with a lot of um, creators. So everything from 4 4 tunes to just uh, small one-man operators to unearth these different creator talents and trying to have different ways of telling stories. If you're ever interested, I'd suggest you go to our Instagram page take a look at the different forms of videos or the statics to, to really get a view. And so we're always looking at what uh, more the individual creators are doing. There's also people in the, uh, in this field like Bleacher Report who are, who are doing a great job in, in terms of storytelling and devising ways to, to talk to an audience, a non-traditional audience, some emerging markets, some, who are just into players, etc., and I think they're doing a great job. And, and um, there's a number of different third parties that we work with, and, and that's that's for us, or definitely for me and the team, is unearthing these talents of how to tell stories in different ways, um, opposed to just looking what uh, other leagues and federations are doing. Yeah. Um, without sounding too cocky, I really think that uh, the stuff that Mark's team is doing is, um, is really top-notch, it's really great stuff. Um, and I truly believe that um, a lot of other um, leagues um, and other sports organizations are having uh, an eye on what we are doing. Um, and when we get feedback from official sites like YouTube and so, they always say that we have a really, 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 really great channel. 
Um, and therefore, I think the stuff that we are doing is, is really great stuff. It's, sometimes it's bold stuff and very courageous to do so. Um, because as a league, um, you're always, um, you always have to act in a certain framework of some rules which you have to align to. And it makes it sometimes a little bit hard to always find the new great uh, kind of content format. Um, but I think um, we're doing really great stuff. But besides that, of course, others are doing great stuff as well. Um, and I think it's always good to, to have a look at those who, are, um, who have some innovative stuff like Formula E and, and the Formula One guys are doing some great stuff, which is not truly comparative to what we do, but there are some, some nice ideas behind it. And of course, the, the NFL has, because of the power that they have uh, be behind the league, um, the powers that they have with the NFL digital team, which is um, four times or five times big, bigger than, than us. And uh, of course, they do, they do great stuff uh, too. But when it comes to, to the entire portfolio of digital formats and what guys and leagues are doing, I think we, we are already doing great stuff. Maybe just one addition, uh, just have some time to think about this, <laughs> is uh, in terms of digital activations, I think if you're ever looking to uh, see how uh, you can really produce some really striking and engaging digital activations, I think Adidas and Nike are always at the forefront of, uh, of executing really strong messages that can resonate on a global or a local level and I think um, been really consistent for a number of years now, so I think uh, if any, any of you guys are looking to try and uh, see how, how to execute really high-end activations, I definitely recommend uh, Adidas primarily and, and also Nike. All right, cool. Thank you, guys. I think this has been a really, really interesting uh, e-seminar. I'm very much looking forward as well to the next summer and winter campaign for next, uh, next season or this upcoming season, see what you guys have coming. Um, thanks to the audience for posting those questions. Um, very good as well. Uh, and then thanks again to DFL Digital Sports. Thanks, Bastian. Thanks, Marek. Um, it was a pleasure. And awesome. have a good evening. Thank you, guys. Hope you found it interesting. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.